Today we will start the 20th century by looking at the Progressive Era and look at how some reformers at the turn of the 20th century wanted to change the United States. Progressives targeted the wealthy, robber barons like Carnegie and Rockefeller, Vanderbilt and Morgan, in the name of the majority of Americans. Muckraking journalists highlighted the issues of the day, and Presidents Roosevelt and Wilson would change the role the American government played in the life of its citizens. Let's start by defining the progressive movement. It was the period between 1901, when Theodore Roosevelt became president, and 1917, when the United States entered World War I, where reformers would change the country politically, socially, and economically. The movement was a response to American society in the Gilded Age, which was dominated by industrialization. The citizenry in the United States started questioning work conditions, the power held by corporations. They wanted a government that did something for the people and did not bow to the wishes of wealthy corporate leaders. The excesses of the Gilded Age played a major role in causing the Progressive Era. The gap between the rich and poor grew by an extraordinary amount during the Gilded Age. The practices of robber barons like Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller, who were referred to as robber barons because of the tactics they used to amass their fortunes, were called into question by reformers and eventually the government during the Progressive Era. And to be able to amass these fortunes, they needed labor, people who would work long hours in unsafe conditions for low pay. We will see the rise of labor unions during the Gilded Age, and we'll see improvements for workers during the Progressive Era. We will look at organized labor in our next installment. Muckrakers played a major role in informing Americans about the things progressives believed plagued Americans. They were labeled muckrakers because they wrote about the dirty realities of American politics and the terrible conditions facing American workers. They were literally raking the muck. The goal was readership, and these stories were well-researched and written with sensational detail. White, urban, middle-class Americans were the target audience, and they liked these stories and also started organizing to take actions against some of the things they read about. Examples of muckraking included Ida Tarbell's History of Standard Oil, which was published in McClure's magazine in 1893. McClure's was a popular magazine at the turn of the century where a lot of this muckraking journalism was published. Tarbell's work is, pu is credited with hastening the breakup of Standard Oil by the government. Lincoln Steffen's The Shame of the Cities included a series of articles he wrote also for McClure's regarding corruption in major cities, like his Tweed Days in St. Louis. These articles raised public awareness about what was happening across the United States. And the most, one of the most famous examples of muckraking was Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. It was a novel that highlighted the experience of immigrants in the 20th century in American factories. And while Sinclair wanted to write a book that talked about working conditions, most people focused on its coverage of the American meatpacking industry. Its publication led to the creation of the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Meat Inspection Act in 1906. And we'll have more on these in just a minute. Here are a few examples from Upton Sinclair's The Jungle to show the type of writing that people would read during the Progressive Era. Here is a population, low class and mostly foreign, hanging always on the verge of starvation and dependent for its opportunities of life upon the whim of men every bit as brutal and unscrupulous as the old-time slave drivers. Under such circumstances, immorality is exactly as inevitable and as prevalent as it is under the system of chattel slavery. Here, Sinclair is comparing the horrendous working conditions of the day to those of slaves, this was the type of sensational writing that one could expect to find from muckraking journalists. Another example, this is no fairy story and no joke. The meat will be shoveled into carts and the man who did the shoveling will not trouble to lift out a rat even when he saw one. People read that there might have been a rat in their meat and Sinclair had their attention. In one last example, they were beaten, they had lost the game, they were swept aside. It was not less tragic because it was so sordid, because that it had to do with wages and grocery bills and rents. They had dreamed of freedom, of a chance to look about them and learn something, to be decent and clean, to see their child grow up to be strong. And now it was all gone. It would never be. These types of stories played on people's emotions and their sense of decency. People read this in the works of people like Stephens and Tarble and wanted a change. Theodore Roosevelt is one of the more interesting people to ever hold the office of president. He was a Harvard graduate, an author, boxer, 
big game hunter. He served as Secretary of the Navy. He was a hero in the Spanish-American War. We'll talk about the Spanish-American War in our next unit. He was governor of New York and was selected by the Republican Party to be vice president in 1901 in order to get him out of the spotlight because of his efforts to stop political corruption in New York. And there was no better place to hide someone than in the vice presidency, unless, of course, the president is assassinated and William McKinley became the second United States president to be killed on September 6, 1901, at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York, by the anarchist Leon Sholgosh. Theodore Roosevelt, cousin of future president Franklin Delano Roosevelt, would then become the 26th president of the United States. As president, Roosevelt would change traditional thinking during the Gilded Age that the government had a limited role in the lives of Americans and in business. Roosevelt believed that the president should be an active player and he embraced a, prog a progressive agenda for the United States. He said, it is the duty of the president to act upon the theory that he is the steward of the people and to assume that he has the legal right to do whatever the needs of the people demand, unless the Constitution or laws explicably forbid him to do it. And his reform agenda for the United States was known as the Square Deal. As part of his Square Deal, Roosevelt worked to break up monopolies and trusts, earning the nickname Trust Buster, as he wanted the government to play a central role in the process of breaking up big business. This type of intervention would never have happened during the Gilded Age. Also, the Bureau of Corporations was created to look at corporate activity. Roosevelt also played a central role in settling the anthracite coal strike in 1902. This was the first time the government played a neutral role in negotiations between labor and industry. The government had always favored business. Here, Roosevelt helped settle the strike and get the workers back on the job. After Upton Sinclair's The Jungle was published, Roosevelt signed the Meat Inspection Act, which gave the government the ability to uh, inspect meat plants to make sure that the meat they were producing was suitable for human consumption. They also signed the Pure Food and Drug Act, which made sure that foods and drugs were properly labeled so people knew what they were ingesting into their body. Both of these were signed in 1906 and were major pieces of progressive legislation and showed that the government was taking a much more active role in industry. The U.S. Forest Service was established in 1905 and set aside hundreds of millions of acres of land for, fe for federal forests. Roosevelt supported these efforts and challenged mining, timber, and oil company interests in support of the interests of the people. The many parks that resulted from Roosevelt's commitment to conservation is one of the lasting legacies of his presidency. The active progressive administration of Theodore Roosevelt changed the role of the government in American business and marked a major change from the Gilded Age that would be continued by his successors. Roosevelt was elected in 1904 but decided not to run for re-election in 1908. William Howard Taft was Roosevelt's hand-picked successor. Taft had been Roosevelt's Secretary of War and easily won election in 1908. And while achieving some progressive successes in trust busting and conservation, Taft ended up becoming a victim of conservatives in his own Republican Party. Taft was not able to keep everyone satisfied like Roosevelt. Progressives in the Republican Party, who had been supporters of Theodore Roosevelt, could not support the conservative policies of William Howard Taft for president in 1912, Thus, the Republican Party was formed. It selected Roosevelt, who had returned from a safari in Africa, to run for president again. The party came to be known as the Bull Moose Party after Roosevelt proclaimed to be fit as a bull moose. This set up a four-man race for president in 1912 between Republican nominee President Taft, the Bull Moose nominee Theodore Roosevelt, the Democratic nominee Woodrow Wilson, and the Socialist Party nominee Eugene Debs. If we look at the map, the results of the election look to be a blowout, with Woodrow Wilson winning 82% of the Electoral College. But if you took the combined popular vote of Taft and Roosevelt, Republicans received over 50% of the vote. Remember, Roosevelt had been a Republican when president. It would appear that the split in the Republican Party cost the Republicans the election. Now Woodrow Wilson from Stanton, Virginia, would be the 28th president of the United States. Woodrow Wilson had been president of Princeton University and the governor of New Jersey before running for president in 1912 when he defeated Roosevelt, Taft, and Eugene Debs. He was the first Democrat since Grover Cleveland in 1897 and the first Southerner since Zachary Taylor in 1850, you know, before the Civil War, 
to be elected president. He, like Roosevelt, believed the government should be active and not idly sit by like presidents from the Gilded Age. Wilson's progressive agenda was known as the New Freedom. It called for a stronger antitrust act to break up trusts and monopolies. The Clayton Antitrust Act gave the federal government even more power in breaking up big business. Wilson sought lower tariffs because lower tariffs would lower the price of consumer goods for Americans. The Underwood-Simmons tariff created the lowest, lowest tariff in the United States since the 1850s. And the FTC, or the Federal Trade Commission, created a five-person panel to investigate the operations of corporations, even forcing them to publish reports on their activities. Again, this demonstrates the government taking invested interest in business on behalf of the people. Wilson supported the passage and ratification of the 16th Amendment to the Constitution, which created the federal income tax. It allowed the government to tax individual incomes and corporate profits with a graduated tax. That means the more one makes, the more they pay. This brought a significant amount of money into the federal government. The Revenue Act, passed at the same time, set the top marginal rate at 6%. The Federal Reserve Act established the first central banking system in the United States since Andrew Jackson vetoed the Second National Bank in 1836. The act created 12 district banks that was supervised by the Federal Reserve Board. The board sets monetary policy and controls the amount of money in circulation. The Federal Reserve still exists today. It has gone through changes, especially during the Great Depression, which we'll talk about in the very near future. The Farm Loan Act allowed farmers to receive low-interest loans from the government, and by 1916, Woodrow Wilson even supported women's suffrage, as he worried about being re-elected president, and he needed to gain as many votes from those who supported Teddy Roosevelt in 1908 as possible. We will look at more progressive accomplishments next time, and we'll even let women vote. And until then, good night, Albuquerque.